sh I can't cheers with water. That feels stupid. Listen, if you want to take the inners out, you go do it. <sighs> go. It's. I mean, it's 4 p.m. for you. It's 7 p.m. for me. That makes a lot so, more sense. Mine. Mine is yeah. only one hour sad. Yours is it, it completely excusable. What I would say. I would say it's one hour sad, but I ate dinner already, so it's like. <laughs> but mine was like, uh, you just gave up an hour early. You're supposed to wait till five o'clock. There's no country right. that song that says it's four o'clock somewhere. Right. Well, look if at that. It makes you feel any better. So, like, here's the drink. Yes. Here's the rest of the bottle. <laughs> I'm just. What do you hold I'm, up? Let's let. What are you? What are you getting into? What is this? It, today is Cooper's daughter from uh, this place, upstate New York, smoked, smoked maple. maple. It's a little it's a little sweet because they finish it in uh maple syrup barrels. Have you always been a bourbon man or or what is what has always been your vibe? Because I I was at first a scotch man and then I got I got hip to as snooty and pretentious as scotch is, I got hip to bourbon and then it became like I I became as much of an aficionado of bourbon. Like where what was your walk me through? This is the most important yeah. thing we should talk about. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I would say that it started, um, I was never, I never gave a shit about drinking in like college or anything like that when people usually figure, figure that out. Um, I started, it, it really didn't start until I would be like, you know, doing theater in New York and then the show would end and then people would go to the bar like ne right near the theater and go. Um, but now that I'm like thinking about this, I've never given this any thought whatsoever. It fully started with just like, what's the cheapest one? Uh... And it would just be just like Jack and Coke. And then I kind of just slowly started realizing that life was, um, life was worth a little bit more than that. And I, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna <laughs> drink, it should at least taste like something. Life was worth a little bit more. I could do better. That, that's what <laughs> Jack Daniels is. Look, I mean, that's a long legacy in an American tradition, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Th their, their, their slogan should be Jack Daniels. You can do better. <laughs> I'm Jim not gonna, B, I'm not gonna make a, anybody mad. I'm not gonna make anybody mad. What, how, how long have you been in New York? Like, where did you grow up? I grew up in New Jersey. So, um, let me think that would be my whole life in New Jersey. Um, like we're talking traffic 20 minutes into, into Manhattan close. Right. Um, but I never really, I never really, um, I don't know. I, my family were never really those people who like went into the city for, unless there was like a very, like a very clear reason. Um, but I moved here. I went to college on Staten Island, which technically is New York city. Um, but I've been living here properly, gosh, what year was that? Uh, 2014, so six years. Six years. Six years. Six years. How quickly have those six years? I mean, have they gone as quickly? I'm going to turn this fucking thing off. <laughs> it's probably like a wind tunnel. Have they gone by as quickly for you as they, I mean, 2014, I think about. How old are you? I just turned 30 a couple uh Oh, that's right. Weeks ago. I, just I, a couple weeks I sent ago. you a message. I was like, dude, congratulations, dirty 30. I, yeah. if I knew my thirties were going to be as cool as they were, I would have skipped. That's what 20s. everybody keeps saying, you know, it's what everybody keeps saying. I, I, it's funny you say the thing about the twenties. Cause I, um, you know, I've lived quite a, a, a life in, in those kind of six years. If that, so it's that thing where I think back to where I was kind of at the beginning of my twenties when my career really kind of started. How did your career um, start? Like what, oh, what are you geez. doing? What am I? Well, what that's a, that's a, <laughs> what am I doing in this present fucking moment or what? Or, like what led you to this? How did you, well, how did you, I mean, we should probably, I don't, I don't like links and descriptions and shit like that. We'll always kind of help, okay. help people, but you, I don't even know how this came to be. Like how, yeah, how are we sat in front of each other right now? How are we sat happen? in front of each other? It's uh, it's a long story. Well, we're technically sat in front of each other uh, because of a, a mutu mutually knowing uh, Cliffy B. Uh, he he put us in touch with each other. That's um, right. But that's like the end of the like. Cliff is like the the end of the twenties. You know what I, you know what I mean? I I uh, yeah. I didn't. Um, I don't know, man. I started playing guitar when I was twelve years old. Um, and that's kind of how it everything started because up until then I was just I didn't you know I was a kid doing it's that thing where you have interests but it, I feel like everybody at some point when they're younger they have that moment where the interest becomes like something different sure. um, you know whatever it is and for me it was guitar when I turned 12 
Um, <laughs> you know, I, I wanted to I wanted to play guitar because I wanted to be like I wanted to be like Blink One Eighty Two and like Green Day, and that was the music I was listening to. Um, and yeah, man, I mean that was kind of what I did. I was in bands uh, growing up. I, I played in bands throughout high school and um, I didn't acting in any capacity was in no way on my radar whatsoever. I just wasn't, I wasn't thinking about it in any way um, until I saw my school had a, a, a drama club as schools do. And I was in it just to hang out with my friends and, and do things and whatever. Um, but I saw this show uh, spring awakening um, in 2006 and um, so I was like 15 or 16. I don't remember exactly how old. And I was blown away by the show because it, um, you know, it, it, the music is written by Duncan Sheik. Um, if you're familiar with Duncan Sheik, yeah, I, I am barely breathing. Uh, and I saw this role and I was just blown away by it because, you know, it wasn't what I thought musicals were. Uh, it wasn't what I thought, you know, because it was like rock music. It was about young people. The, the performers were not... Um, the performers were not like musical theater performers. They were just like people, you, you know, I, and I don't mean that to disparage me. I'm, I'm, I am not literally a musical theater. All. I'm literally a musical theater performer, but, <laughs> but I'm, you know, you're not going to see me getting cast in, you're not going to see me getting cast in like, you know, uh, the music man. That's not what I'm going right. to, that's not who I Rogers am. Rogers and Hammerstein is not what you're going no. for. Richard Sherman. Unless we're doing some for. gritty reboot where everybody dies. At the end. <laughs> then they'll, they'll, they'll find a, They'll find a spot for me at the end of that one. Emo but, music, uh, man. That's what... <laughs> yeah, 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 dude. Yeah, dude. Um, but, but yeah. And, and so I, 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 started to care about it and i just i my school my high school was so small that um if you signed up for the school play school you, music play, you, were just, you just were in it like that was that especially if you were a boy um and you know this thing happened where i i was my senior year was approaching and that thing starts happening where you're like because for some reason this country puts pressure on 18 year olds to know what they're supposed to want to do for their entire life but that's sure. like a conversation. <laughs> i was stuck between if i wanted to be a musician Mm. Uh, if I wanted to act or if I wanted to uh, go into game development uh, because I loved video games my whole life. I was deep into the Counter-Strike modding community and oh, I was, uh, no. yeah, yeah, I was like, I was like animating and like making skins and stuff like that just for my bedroom for fun. So I was like stuck between these three, three things. And I remember I was seeing schools uh, in the city for, uh, you know, game design and stuff like that. And uh, I don't know, I just felt something that was like, this probably is not what it's supposed to be. So then I started auditioning for colleges and I don't understand how I got into some because I'm pretty sure I was super, super bad. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I was real bad. Uh, but it's, um, yeah, and then, and then a bunch of crazy circumstances that I won't bore you with led to me getting an agent and I started working during college. So I was lucky enough to be getting my actual training while auditioning for things and, and applying it which was a, definitely a luxury because when you don't need to worry about where your food is coming from, mm -hmm. uh, it's much easier to, it's much easier to not give a shit about the work and you could just try things and whatever. But um, yeah, man, work note it. My, you know, I had, I had done some television and film throughout college, but my first gig out of college was the national tour of uh, Green Day show, American Idiot. Is that where you met? I did, that's where I met Liam, who you had oh on the last episode. Gosh. Yeah him and i him and i saw this whole country together man um liam's the best um but yeah so i did that show and pretty much immediately thereafter it was like all right that was a uh, senior year 2.0 if that makes any sense because i graduated and immediately did it um and it was uh you know how cool to be in the fucking green day musical when you're you know 22 years old Dude. on a on a bus with people around <laughs> around america um for how long? How yeah. long did you guys tour? It was like a year, one full year, one full year. Like pretty much the exact amount of time. We left in September and I think we ended in June. So it was truly like another school year. Hmm. Um, and it was a cool a cool way to do it. But um, yeah, and then after that, I I ended up doing this 15 minute long Lin-Manuel Miranda musical, um, which is on This American Life, which you should watch right after this. Um, I'm down you'll find for it. it with, You'll find it with that Google. Uh, just type <laughs> Lin Manuel Miranda, This American Life. They put the whole thing up on YouTube. Y you can watch it. Um, but then um, I'm being long winded, but it's it's kind of worth the payoff. That's the vibe. But while while I was doing American Idiot, the guy who was the music supervisor for that show, uh, he was working on 
a revival of that original show, Spring Awakening, uh, that I was in. They were doing a revival of it out in Los Angeles um, with the Deaf West Theater, um, which is what it sounds like. It's a theater. It's a theater for deaf, for, for deaf, the deaf, deaf artists, this cool. and that. And uh, this, I wasn't sure this, if it was D-E-A-F or D-E-F, like if it was like... Like most deaf. No, it was deaf as in... As Russell in, Simmons uh, had something to do with it or something. No, no, I mean dope in another way but no um <laughs> but um yeah and so so this dude michael arden was doing a he wanted to re-envision the show um the show's about young people and their kind of sexual awakenings and and dealing with the things young people deal with um but um he wanted to the show takes place in the 1800s and he wanted to reframe it as these characters are deaf um, and you know, the reason this character is struggling in school now is because he is deaf and no one is giving him access to the education he needs it, like mm -hmm. a theatrical conceit that really reframes everything, but it's a musical. So when, um, a deaf actor is in a musical, they need someone to voice for them to speak and sing for them while they're signing. Interesting. Um, so that is where I came into play. Um, I had reached out to this music dude and I was like, look, man, I know you're working on this. Like. I see that the role of Moritz, the one that made me want to be an actor, is going to be played by a deaf person, but you need a guitarist and a singer and an actor who can voice for him. Uh, can I audition? And he was like, I'm going to be honest with you, dude, it's at a 99 seat theater in LA. It's going to pay $100 a week. You probably can't move uh, to Los Angeles for this. So I said no to it, but um, the universe works as it, as it will. And, and uh, the show moved to a different theater in Los Angeles. I got asked to do it. I didn't even audition. And then that ended up going to Broadway. So then, you know, I know, I know. At, at 24, I found myself on Broadway playing a reimagined version of the role that made me want to be an actor. Um, and so I kind of peaked. <laughs> I, peaked. I, I, I didn't peak, but I, I hope not. it was, it was a, a mind-blowing kind of full circle moment. And then, um, yeah, I've just been fucking around the city. I did <laughs> Dear Evan Hansen for two years. I... I met Cliff through that, which is how we met. Uh, and then while doing Dear Evan Hansen, my girlfriend and I produced a show called Hades Town. Um, that's on. that. The, okay, so that, this, I knew about Dear Evan Hansen. Mm -hmm. Walk me through when you say we produced this show <laughs> called Hades Town. Yeah, so I, in between, after, after I had done Spring Awakening, I, um, had a as actors do you know you have that moment where i'm like i'm one of the principal roles on this broadway show i'm gonna fucking take the city by storm they're gonna throw me on television right after this and then i didn't work at all for like mm -hmm. you know two years and um i needed money because i do not come from money, and I keep making money. <laughs> i am not a man um, of means i must yes, make my no. means <laughs> yes so I, I noticed one of the lead producers on Spring Awakening, who was a good dude who I knew, needed an assistant. And I hit him up and I was like, yo, dude, I have no idea how to be your assistant whatsoever. But like, you like me, I like you. If that's what the job is and you just need me to like make your calendar work and tell you to show up places, then like we can make this work. And so I ended up being this dude's assistant for, uh, for years. And it was great because I got to learn about the producing side of the industry while you know, I'd be like, hey, dude, I'm ducking out for a half hour. I have an audition 10 blocks away. I'll be back. You know what I mean? And, and that's what would happen. Um, but this dude, he, he started this initiative. Um, he noticed that most Broadway producers, like we're talking like 90% uh, are older white men, hmm. like over 60, old, rich white men. And he said, well, I'm a white man in my 40s what can I do to change the way that this is going to look going forward? So he started this initiative to kind of train people deemed underrepresented as producers, um, to train them how to be producers. So that included anybody under 30 and included uh, women, LGBTQ people, um, um, people of color, whatever. You would come to these meetings to leverage a network of people that you know, because it's that thing where it's like, even if you don't think you know uh, somebody who has money who can help help you raise money you probably like your cousin's cousin loves the theater sure. and might be interested in this right so so my girlfriend and i kind of joined that initiative and we wow. found ourselves with the opportunity to try to make hades town open um and try to be producers on that because i'd loved that album for years because it was an album before it was a musical 
and we we kind of did it. We reached out to our network. It it was difficult. It involved raising money really under the gun, <laughs> but um, that's what producing is. Is you gotta, you know, you gotta you rate you raise money. It's, it's yeah. it is what it is, and you reach out to everybody you possibly know. And in the case of Hades Town, thank goodness the people we um, brought in made their money back very quickly because Hades Town is a big hit. Um, and then we won Huge. the uh, we won we then we won the silly trophy. <laughs> You know, that silly trophy that they give it's just yeah. willy-nilly to whomever. I remember the first time sitting in the theater. I was, I was with um, Travis Willingham and Laura Bailey, and I was, I, I was, I was, I love, I just love going to the theater. And especially now I look back at like, and we'll talk about, I want to get into this with you because there's a comment that you made um, just in an offline conversation, but about specifically sitting in a theater. And, and I've always kind of been partial for some reason to the West End over Broadway. I don't, know, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's because I have more experiences with the West End than, 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 um, than Broadway. And my, my, the, the shows that I've seen on Broadway have been very limited. But that feeling of right before... You know, curtain's about to go up, and you have no idea what to expect. And I'm like, I wonder if this show's gonna be dog shit. <laughs> and the curtain comes up, and I look, and I see the band, and I went, Oh no! Because the last time I had seen a setup like that, if you haven't seen Hades Town, I can't wait for you to be able to see. Wait, it. you saw Hades Town at the National? Yes. Twice. Fun. Okay. Very good. Very Twice. good for me to know. Very good for me to know. And I'm looking, man. The last time I saw a band set up like that was in the West End when I, I saw um, Once. And I knew immediately, I was like, I'm about to get fucked up. Like, this is going to, I wasn't ready for this. And then the show starts. And I was like, <laughs> and then I start freaking out because there's, you know, we've talked about this, the, the, the musical that we're making with um, uh, Summerfall Studios called Chorus. And there's, there's a lot of similarities between, um, and instantly, it's like, I don't know if you've ever done this where you go, uh, I'm thinking about getting a, a, a white Toyota 4Runner. And all of a sudden, all you see on the road is white Toyota 4Runners. And, in, and you're like, oh, everybody has a white Toyota 4Runner, and so you don't want one anymore. It's like, well, you wanted that before you noticed that everyone else had her, or you just started to notice that car being more prevalent on the road. And I feel like it was actually confirmation that the story that we were trying to tell is resonant and relevant to people. Um, and then you start finding out how long that show has been in the works and how many iterations yeah. and how many versions and how many rewrites and, and just the scratching tooth and claw to make it and doing off, off, off Broadway and then being able to finally make it. Like, people think, oh, that's a new show that's opening in Broadway. And one of the last shows that I saw um, was a, um, oh my God, well, I can't think of his name. He, he, he just recently died. Um, Sam, uh, not Sam Elliott, but not Sam Neill. Oh my God. Um, Fool for Love. Who am I thinking of? Damn it. Oh, my God. It's almost as if we can uh, ask the internet. Hang on. Who be, who's going to be your first? Sam Clicky. Shepard. Sam, Sam Shepard. Sam Shepard. Sam and this Sam is Shepard. what sucks, man. Is Sam Shepard was one of the ones that I wanted to meet before before he died. And he just died, uh, I think, two years ago. But um, I remember sitting in, in the theater. Um, actually, I think it was across the National, um, where he was showing um, Fool for Love, um, and just sitting in the theater, and you know, you've got you've got these huge the the blockbuster version, the, the tentpole version, the Avengers version of whatever hits on Broadway, and it's you're always going to see Cats, and you're going to see you know Harry Potter, you're going to see, which is apparently a really really good show, um, but you're going to see these big shows. But then there's the small things, which with what Broadway was built upon, the backs of it, which were these just playwrights that were putting their souls up on stage with two performers or three performers. And it was one of those vibes, and it's not a particularly funny play, but there's moments of levity, and the people that, you know, they bought a pass to see as many shows as they could in, in one weekend were in that theater with Pam and I, and they were 
not getting it. They were coughing. People were on their phones. And I wanted to just stand up and go, you don't deserve this play. Now imagine, imagine being on stage and oh seeing them God. on their phones. <laughs> how do you fight? Let me ask you this. How, yeah, do yeah. You, how do you fight that? How do you stand on a stage? And this is your 80th show in a row you feel like and you just you, you're like you have no idea the day that i had i'm starting to feel like i got that tickle in the back of my throat and this is the this is the seven o'clock and i got to do the 9 30 and i don't know if i'm going to be able to get through this and some jackhole is in like row six he played he paid 600 bucks 500 bucks for that seat and he's just doing this bullshit phone right. lit up with his arrogance how how do you not forget like how do you learn the lines and how do you learn the choreography and how do you learn the right. cues fuck that how do you not go excuse me sir get the fuck out of my theater <laughs> i know i know it's it's hard it's hard but i always say am i gonna let that dude ruin it mm. for the 14 year old in the last row with their mom and dad sure. who waited two years to see this play who, who who may see this show and may have the transformative experience I had when I was 15 or 16 years old. You know what I mean? That's what that's what it is. That's 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 what it is. You know what I mean? Like with with a show like um with a show like Dear Evan Hansen specifically or Spring Awakening as well, I I both characters I played die by suicide in those shows. And I I always would think about on the days I don't want to do it or the days where someone in the audience is being a poop head or whatever. Like I always think about, I'm like, dude, like if I don't believe that art is a transformative thing, mm. then why am I up here? And I need to, I need, I need to, somebody out there needs to see this show about, about this. Somebody out there is going to see the character I'm playing and they might be thinking about, about about killing themselves and mm. they might you know what i mean and i know that i'm putting really heavy stakes on it but i've had um, no dude i've had pretty um i'm i'm both lucky i'm lucky and blessed and also it's like uh, the weight of playing people like that um has not ever ever been lost on me um you know because i've lost people in my own life to it always think about like there's a thousand people out there one of them one of them is feeling something yeah. do you know what i mean and, and one of them is going to see this kid and one of them is going to respond and based on the letters that would come to the theater or if i went out the stage door after the show to you know sign autographs for the people who are waiting or whatever you know as i'm you get somebody who tells you you know i you know i i i i had a suicide attempt a year ago and mm -hmm. or or i saw this this performance and uh, six months ago and i had to come back just to tell you that like you know, it, it let me know how my parents might feel if I did this. And you know what I mean? It's, it's, there's a responsibility to it, man, especially when you're on a scale that, that big, you know what I mean? You're on your, it's, it's, I'm, I'm here to tell you that like being on Broadway really does not feel much different than mm. doing a show at your college or your high school. Like it sounds better and it looks better and the performers are probably a little bit better, but like you forget all the time, the grat, like that you are, you know, the word Broadway means something to people, people from all over the world, they know what it is, you know, yeah. so you forget all the time. And it's, it's those moments that kind of bring you back down to earth. And those are kind of the things that make you say like, stop being, I don't, I don't give a fuck if you're tired for two and a half hours, you're going to, you're going to tell the story that you're being paid to tell. And it's going to help somebody. How do you keep it fresh? How do you walk out on the stage and hit the same cues? I, I, I've, my theater experience is so unfortunately very limited because I, I stumbled into this you know you you I felt like you were kind of like Robert Frost and there was like there are more than just two roads in the woods but you there were there were multiple like which way do I want to go um and all of them would have had equal adversity and hardships but you 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 simply were like this is the one that is affording me an opportunity so I'm going to go this this path and you still are able you like me are able to kind of well, now I'm going to come back and fuck you, by the way. You're an incredible guitarist. I mean, talk, we'll talk about Duncan Sheik and your guitarist uh, in a little bit. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Um, but how do you... The, there, there are tenements that I people... You know, when I was six years old, I was a conservatory, and that's why I was able to know these. <laughs> I was like, I don't know any of those things. I, I, I learned because I, I made a mistake, and someone grabbed me by the collar and said, don't ever do that again. And, and then it just continually do that. 
So how, what, what is that? Like, I, I know what it's like if you're in a scene and you're able to, we can cut and pick up and go back again. And there's no audience, there's no guy in the fourth row and there's no teenager in the back row that have paid a large sum of money to have this trans, hopefully transformative experience. There's just some crew that are on their phones and they're supposed to be and it's fine that they are and there's weird cameras or whatever. So this is a different kind of gig you have that one shot and then you may have a next one that later that night. How do you find the freshness? How do you keep it to where it's like, what, what is that for you? Yeah. I mean, it's easier if the show is good. Um, that kind of, <laughs> what if it's honestly, shit though, because yeah, like, I mean, speaking yeah. to the people that don't have the, like, like you said, this works on Broadway. You're like every, every day I think I'd walk out there and go, holy shit, I can't believe I'm here. But I've been on the set of The Last of Us and I've been tired. I've been like, man, we've been really hitting it hard and I'm tired. I don't feel good. And that notion of I can't believe that I'm on a Naughty Dog game doesn't necessarily sustain you on your 60th day shooting. So what is that if you've you've had the benefit of being at a great show? But like, what if you're on a shitty yeah. show? What does that look like? Yeah. It looks like it looks like the moments of of looking into the eyes of the person you're in the scene with or 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 being like what can I how can I be just fucking present in this moment no matter even if I'm saying like you know uh to, today we're gonna skip off to the lollipop shop like if, if like that's what it is that's what it is and 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 how lucky are you to be making your insurance weeks man like Oof. It, that's what it is like th that is what it is it's it's a constant reminder that like not not only did you sign up for this <laughs> you're doing it right and and it's again it's way easier when the show is good and you know i personally have been uh, tremendously lucky to basically only do things that i think are really good right and that 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 are written by people at the top of their game and stuff like that. But like, I've done, I've done plenty. I've done like workshops or readings of shows where I'm like seeing it and I'm like, Oh Jesus, not gonna, like, <laughs> it's not the one, but, but I think the most important thing is to just be like, I, I have this two and a half hours. I, I like, I don't know, man. I don't know. I think, I think, I think it comes down to just being as present as you can for those minutes that you're on the stage if you want to be tired and if you want to be a little fucking baby mm -hmm. and you want to complain, find the people backstage who you, who, who will listen to you and, and commiserate with you and not judge you. Don't ever complain to an understudy who mm -hmm. wishes they were out on that stage every night. Don't you dare lose your humility, you know, but, but if you want to be tired, do it. But when you were out on that stage, I don't care if you are, I don't care if you are performing something that feels like it was written by somebody who like just learned how to spell. You have to give it what it you have to you have to respect the people who showed up enough and i think i get i get fired up about this because i've i've definitely worked with people who do not share this opinion and who, mm. who are maybe a little more um entitled to it, but it's the word i'm gonna use. especially um where we're at now in the state of theater now i think to every show that i was tired and every show that i didn't want to go out on that stage and i want to go back in time and slap myself because I don't know if or when that will ever happen again in the same way that it did. And I, 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 um, I'm very, very aware of it. Something I'm thinking a lot about lately. How do you, or have you, um, those are transcendent truths, right? To be present. I was just talking to somebody about this and the notion of like, uh, forgiveness has been, a, um, a practice that I've, I've been, I feel like I've constantly been chasing for the for the wrongs that have been done to me, or the or, or the offenses that I've I've um, experienced in my life. I've been trying to find to bring myself to a place of forgiveness, and I feel like it's always just been out of reach. And I finally had this like huge epiphany where I was like, "Oh, the reason why I can't forgive, I can't genuinely forgive, and not like I'm feeling better about it today." But then the second that something creeps in that reminds me of it or something new, it just it, it reignites. And I'm like, why? Why am I still bothered by this? And I, I, I finally, after examining, I was like, this is why. It's because it's impossible to heal when you're still hurt. 
And that offense is still happening to me because I'm going back to it. It just happened. Even though I look and go, that was five years ago, three years ago, six months ago. I'm still experiencing that moment as if it was in real time. So how the hell could I forgive when it's still happening? I'm, I just got in the car wreck. Of course I'm going to still be stiff. I'm going to be sore. I could be damaged, injured. And so what the reason, the reason why I bring that up is because what I realized is that I wasn't being present. I was stuck in that moment of offense. And then once I realized I, I, mean, I brought myself present, and literally it was me sitting in the, uh, our library, which is kind of our communal space in our house, and it's where my son likes to pull out his big basket of trucks and cars and dump them out and play with them. And it was being in here with him and just going, I don't have to do anything right now but play with trucks and cars. And I was yeah. like, that's being present. And then forgiveness just, forgiveness is not a goal. It's an end product. It's, it's, it's a residual effect of, of being present. So I'm curious that those are tenements of an actor who spent time on stage and going for these two and a half hours, I just need to lock eyes with my scene partner and be present in this moment. Right now, you're in a really weird place because specifically for you as an actor in New York who has been on that stage for the first time in 40 years of my life, Broadway is dark. How do you translate that skill, that discipline to your life when you're absent of, of that stage in, in many ways, not just the, the literal, but also the metaphorical stage for you to exercise those tenements? What do you do? Yeah, man. Um, I, I think, I think it's going to be a multi-pronged answer. So bear yeah. with me. I love uh, it. Everything, everything you just said was really, really fascinating. Uh, because I was just listening to this podcast. Uh, I'm going to give, I'm going to give another podcast a plug on here Get called it. dead eyes. I'm not sure if you've heard of it yet. Nope. Uh, I'll, Link, we'll talk about it later, me up. <laughs> but, uh, but to Tony Hale, uh, appeared on an episode recently okay. and he was saying, um, he was saying that the most important thing in the world that I have to do today is what I'm doing today. Mm -hmm. And he said, what I'm doing right now, talking to you mm -hmm. is the most important thing in the world for me right now. Come on. And I can't be sitting here thinking about the ifs and the what ifs and the, because if you're constantly chasing, you know, like I, and for the last, like I was in Dear Evan Hansen for two years and I would say for the whole second year, my agent, my manager and I, we were talking about my exit. We were talking about what's next. We were talking about what I want to do next and all these things. And of course that's natural to do, man. It's, it's what, it's what this business is. And it, it trains you to want to hustle constantly. But, um, this, this amazing thing has happened where it's like, I left, I left Dear Evan Hansen, like, I think four weeks before the pandemic. Wow. So I, I, I was just getting used to my, my identity as this person who's like, you know, got his evenings free again. And I can <laughs> actually audition for things legally without like worrying about breaching a contract. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and then this happens and, and it really makes you it makes, it's been making me telescope outward. And I've been spending so much time talking to my girlfriend about this. And, you know, this idea of like, we, we've spent so much time and it's so sad thinking about what it is that we want, what, what the next thing we're going to get is. And, and we spend no time just as people, not even just artists. We spend no time like focusing on where, where we're at. And, and, and at the end of my life, if I continued, you know, when I'm an old man and I'm in my deathbed, I'm not going to look back at all of the, what, the times I, what I wanted next. I'm going to look back at the things that I was, that I did. Right. Sure. I'm going to look back at, and I, I'm not going to remember that feeling of what do I want next? What do I want next? So all that does is leave me with like less opportunity to create those moments that I'm going to look back on. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. If I'm con and so, so, so that's part of this first, first off cool. is, is learning who, who, who I am as a human, this, um, because my, I, this is what I have been for 10 years. This is what I, this is what I've known. This is what I've been. If I'm, if I'm working, if I'm in a TV show, if I'm in a movie, I'm or, uh, uh, in theater, that's what I am. And when I'm not, I'm an auditioning actor. I'm, I'm trying to get the next thing. Mm. And now none of these things exist. I've had like two on camera auditions in the last six months because nothing's shooting, you know? Right. So it's like a reframing of what your, even your day to day is. And, and so hmm. I've, 
I've sat around and I'm like, who am I? And what are the things that I personally want to do? And for me, that has turned into uh, what I would call a maybe too much charity work. Um, <laughs> my, like to the point of like, like myself and uh, Andrew Feldman. Uh, Andrew is the, uh, the young man who played Evan Hansen with me in my second year when I was in the show. Um, he just had this idea to play Jackbox with some friends on a stream at the beginning of this when we thought it was only going to be like two weeks long. Hmm. And, you know, uh, my producer brain kicked in and I was like, Andrew, we had like 800 people watching that. We should be raising money for the Actors Fund. So we kind of came up with ways to do that. And we, we've raised like over $100,000 for the Actors Fund over the course of this. And we, we've, Damn. you know, I, I've, I've just turned into somebody who needs to, you know, I recognize that like I have a platform particularly one with like young impassioned uh, fans. Cause that's the shows that I've done. That's how it is. And I've, you know, figuring out ways to reach out to them, find out like, Hey, young person, how do you feel about this thing that's happening in the world? Like, and trying to learn. And I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to, I, so many things, man, trying to learn, trying to understand, trying to, trying to, trying to still entertain in some way, you know, mm. trying to find other, other ways to like, take their mind off of how scary it is that they've got to go back to school. You know what I mean? And like, right. like all, all, all of this stuff. And, and, you know, I started, um, I started a Twitch channel, which is something I was like, I'm not going to do for the longest time. Cause I'm a serious actor and I play mm. serious roles and uh, nobody can see that side of me. But then I realized I'm like, bro, you like playing video games and people need something to watch. Just do it. Yeah. And, and so like, then that happened. And, uh, you know, I'm not really answering your question, but I think it's yeah, indicative of, I think it's indicative of like, none of us know, dude. And like, none of us know what to do is, is kind of the, the long and short of it. And everyone's trying different things and, and theater is going to figure its way back because it has to, because it's such an American art form and an American thing, but I don't know what, it, I don't know what it looks like for me. Hmm. I don't know what it looks like for, I think more about the person who was so close. You know what I mean? <sighs> yeah. Dude. I don't think about I don't think about me, man, because like when shows start coming back and they need another like, you know, person who's sad, they're gonna call me. Like I'm gonna be one of the guys they call. Like I think about I think about so many friends of mine, man, who were who were one audition away, man, who were so close, and I'm like, what happens to these people? What happens to these people who are not? who are not just lucky enough to have like parents with a lot of money who can keep them in their apartment in the city. You know, I have so many friends who had to move out of the city to try to save a buck. And I'm like, fuck, are you going to be able to come back? Mm. And I, and, and I, 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 I just think about those people so much more. And I think about, yeah, I think, I think I, I could, I could talk about it forever. Do you, th th there, I hit a point in my life where I was like, okay, it's talking of all right so what are we gonna do next and i'm i'm fortunate to have a relationship with my agent that is we're constantly crafting opportunities right. and, and and wondering what is on the horizon um not at the sake of the moment but also trying to look ahead and go what do we do next um it's just, it's just smart business it is because and, and that's and i also leave a lot of that to her because i i, I like to vision and forecast and and, and dream um, but she's a, she's an actualizer. So I, I go, I think it'd be cool if we could do this. She was like, great. That's about two years away. Um, and it is like being able to look and go, we know that this game has a finite dev cycle. We're going to be done. We're going to ship ish around 18 to two years, 18 months to two years. This show that we're doing, you know, if we get picked up for more seasons, great. But we can probably assume that you're going to be done in about three months. You're going to be done six months, maybe. So it's constantly going, you gotta feed that pipeline. And that is the, I'll never forget my first big movie that I ever did, Steve Zahn, um, who's remained a good friend. Um, the day that we wrapped, it was like, that's it. That's a picture wrap on the Rangers. And, and our whole group of uh, the principal actors, there was like 10 of us. Um, he goes, that's a wrap and everybody's applauding. And he looks at me and he goes, well, back to the audition circuit. And I went, what? He goes, yeah. You think I got a script tree in my backyard? No, man. It's a. It's always a grind, and that's that was like my first wake up call. I was like, oh shit! I just thought you hit a level, and people just like get me, get me Troy Baker. And every once in a while, like you said, is like we need someone sad. Well, let's call Alex. We can get him. We know that he's a solution to the problem. But by and large, it's like, it's the 
you're building the bridge as you're walking across it. It's constantly taking faith. Um, yeah, man. But I, I, what I see in you is, is a pattern of someone who does operate in a place of faith as, as opposed to a, a place of fear. But have you... I, the whole reason why I was setting that up is that I've, I've started wanting to go. I don't want to wait for the phone to ring, metaphorically. No, anybody that calls me is just, what are you doing? S- shoot me a text or, you know, I better be in trouble if you're calling me. <laughs> uh, we have Zoom, for the love of God. I... I want to create opportunities, not only for myself, but you and I, I think, are very kindred spirits in that. We want to create opportunities for other people, and it's, I have a heart and a passion for those who have a dream, and I go, somebody needed to give me a break. Somebody needed to believe in me, sometimes more than I believed in myself, and go, what do you need to make that happen? And that's who I want to be for people. And it sounds like you're kind of the same way. Are you starting to think about what does Alex make as opposed to what are you just participating in? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a very good question. I, you know, that the, the uh, among the other existential deaths, I am, uh, <laughs> I'm mourning over the course of this. Um, you know, I had, I had been starting to play shows of my own music here in the city. And I had this whole, we had this whole plan for it this whole album like recorded and now i'm i've been sitting months later i've been sitting on it because i sit here and i'm like well i want to make sure i release it properly and everybody i talk to of course is like yeah dude like get in line you know like this is a fake thing don't take this but like selena gomez is sitting on her album too because no one can tour so they're not like putting their stuff out so you know i've got that music it's ready to go i'm just waiting to put it out because it's part of what i wanted to do um you know i think a lot about I think a lot about you know my my need to create in this moment is mostly being serviced between the charity work that I'm doing uh, with my friend Andrew as well as this other thing that we, we've been doing together. Um, those I, I'm feeling good about it because I'm feeling like it's 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 a uh, it's satisfying my need to just output, but it's also hmm. satisfying a need of of my industry and my community, which is money for the Actors Fund. I. I want to talk about the, the guitar thing. First of all, I would really challenge you, man. I I know the pains of, of creating a record and then putting it out. And I actually got a lot of shit for something that I said. And, and I had to, I had to check myself on it because I was, I was doing a live stream and I made an offhand comment at attempting to be funny. And I said, um, if you want to know a way to waste a lot of money, make a record. And, the reason why I was saying that was because my first record, I spent way too much money on it. It was independently. I did it. I funded it myself. And never would I make back that money, ever. Like, never. And the second record, I tried to do a crowdfunding thing, and, and that the company that I used to crowdfund went bankrupt. And so I never got the, the majority of that money. We got a small amount, but we didn't get the majority of the money. And so once again, I'd, I'd, I'd opened up the coffers and finished the project. And we're still still finishing that project. Um, so I made the offhand joke of like, you know, if you want to make a lot of money, make a record. Because a record is not meant to be, has ever been, a, a, a means of making money. Like you said, you make your money off touring and ma- merchandising. Those are the two ways. The, publishing, touring, and merchandising. That's the way you make money. It's never off the record. But I have really appreciated, like, fuck, even Taylor Swift dropping the record now. I was like, yeah, we need that art more than ever now. Yeah. So are you, why not drop that record? Do you, why not do the stupid thing and say it's not about touring it, it's about I need to share this record. What, what's preventing you from doing it? So I, I look, put it out, it's just because just from a, I just want as many people to hear it as possible. Sure. And, and, that's, um, and that's just being like, all right, I can put it out myself and use my own social media platforms to put it out, whatever, that's great. But um you know, it's, it's just that thing of like, we're just, we're just like waiting. We're trying to get it in the hands of some people who it's like, if they dig it, then like, cool, they'll, you know, get some, you know, it'll, the, somebody will write about it. You know what I mean? Like it's I like a game. You. And I, uh, I'm, I'm my, to be frank, my patience is running out and I'm reaching the point where like one day I'm just going to go on distro kid and just it's, it's up and congrats. There it is. But, um, but, but, yeah, man. I mean, I was, I was, I was really proud of. I, I still am really proud of. It. I'll send it to you right after this. Um, Please, you can listen to it. Um, just don't. Uh, 
I'll sue you if you put it on there. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, man. That, of, Troy Baker dropped my record. <laughs> can you imagine? Yeah, can you, can you imagine? Yeah, but, but it, um, that's, that's, that's where it's at. I mean, I, um, yeah, I, 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 I put something out at the beginning of all of this, again, when we thought it would be like one or two months, which was just like a response to that. And that, you know, that went really well, but it, it taught me a lot about where the music industry is right now, which is that like your song could get like hundreds of thousands of plays. Congratulations, you've made, you know, a hundred dollars. Like, it's like, that's what I'm saying. Like, it, and, and that, you know, I have so many of the people who follow me are, are very, very sweet and they're young. I'll get like a tweet that's like, I streamed your song for 12 straight hours. And I'm like, okay, so. That's not how it works. <laughs> Well, you well, thank you. First of all, thank you. I appreciate it. You're gonna have to do that 45 more times, or just pay the dollar for the song, and it's yeah. over. Like, you know what I mean? And it's just it's fascinating how we've uh, we've we've decommodified music to the point that it's something we expect to get for free, uh, and it's it's a fascinating, fascinating uh, uh, thing. You belong to a generation, by, or you're right at the cusp. Like, I remember an interview with Steve Jobs where he says, you can't blame, this is the whole Napster, right when iTunes launched. And he says, you can't blame for people for stealing things when there is no legal alternative. And what we're seeing is that people want digital music. So let's give it to them. And that's what iTunes is. And they asked him point blank. They said, do you think iTunes, he goes, this is your uh, new revenue generator. He goes like, I have three billion in the bank. I don't need a (laughs) revenue generator. This is just my response to the record. This is my attempt to save the record industry. Of course, later, iTunes is the number one revenue gener- generator for. Right. It's far eclipsed what, what their hardware sales are, even the iPhone. So what is, is that an evolution of music to say that we've decommodified it and said it's no longer bought and sold and traded in those senses, but now it is... If the album was never the product, what is the product? How about that from a musical standpoint? What is the pro- is the product the record or is the product the artist or is the product the show? Is it is it do you make the record to, as a commercial to get people to come to the concert or do you are you doing it for the artist and then at that point what what is that point? So well, why build up an artist if there's no you know what I mean? Like, what are we chasing? Or I don't should know. it be decommodified? Yeah, these are these are fascinating questions that I'm not even going to begin to presume to. Yeah, but let's just think about it more. I want to get a bottle of bourbon yeah. with you and like get into it. <laughs> well, look, dude. I mean, I don't know. I think I think I think if I'm answering it for real, I think that the answer is um, it depends on the artist and the kind of music. I think obviously there are some kind of artists out there who it is about the the artist, and we are buying into the of like star and and listening to their album is part of that right Right. but then you're always gonna have your like you know you're always gonna have your like random people who are just putting out like an an art an album that's art and they're like i don't give a fuck if this makes money and they go and like skateboard off and then congrats it's on like (laughs) it it doesn't it doesn't matter and but at the same time i also think there's room for i think there's room for both at the same time because i think about I think about um, Phoebe Bridgers is an amazing example. I don't know if you're familiar with her. She, uh-huh. she, uh, so do that for, uh, okay. do that. But also um, <laughs> she, she, she is a great example. I think of um, an artist who is making the art that they want to make pretty untethered. And that level of being very, 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 very genuine happened to also result in mainstream success because it was inignorable. Like, mm. I don't even know if that's a word, but it was it just now. so, so genuinely from who that person was. And it, and, and it, you know, we then buy into that person from the music. You know what, you know what I mean? Like, I, it, it, so what I'm saying, I think is the Avenue changes depending on the artist and it doesn't really matter. Bon Iver uh, has but, been that yeah. for me. Like I, I kind of wrote bon off. Yeah, I, I, I. You know he plays uh, Orpheus in the Hades Town uh, concept album, right? What? Yeah, go ahead and go ahead and listen to that. It's uh, 2010, I think. What? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My mind is blown, dude. Yeah. Who, who's the super yoked up dude that the guy that's in the chorus? 
that was in oh, Hades Town. Probably, t- probably Tim. Uh, well, actually, that's it's tough because uh, I think the I think the ensemble were. In, I mean, are you talking about here in the states? Or are you talking about in in here England? in the states? The guy that I saw and I saw him twice, and this would have been last fall. Last yeah. fall, both times, yeah, because it was New York Comic Con. I was it was there. I saw it in twice in two months. Um, he is that just the guy that you would never expect to be on Broadway. He's, he's like just like nine hundred feet tall and like yeah. jacked out of his mind. And, right? like, and like, yeah, he's just, he looks like he's like a lineman Tim. for the Giants and just watches. I know, off stage. I know, I know. <laughs> I believe I believe his name is Tim. I actually don't know him. Uh, right. I don't know him personally, but it's it's that thing where like. Dude, if I'm casting a show, which I've never, but if like if that dude walks in, I am sitting behind that table saying, "If you can sing, yeah, it's over. Like it's you're in. I'm finding a spot for your ginormous, ginormous and body. Just that he looks like he was like every show that I saw. Talking about what we were saying is like you have two and a half hours to go out there and give it your all. He yeah, just dude. looks like he was like I can't believe they let me out on stage again. He just looks like he's having the time of his life. Yeah. God damn, that music's so good. Um, mm-hmm. Bonnevere, he, I wrote him off and, um, David, my friend and my assistant was the one who was like, you don't understand what, what he's doing. He's actually, it's not about the song. It's about him letting you into the process of his songwriting. And I, once I kind of watched or listened rather through that lens, it really, it really turned it on for me. I was like, I got you. So I, I completely agree with you by the, the, the notion of um, when you create something that is um, inignorable. Um, right. Un, in, I, I don't know, man. It's a good Someone's word. Someone's going to be so mad. Someone's going to be so comments. mad. You tweeted it. You tweeted at me. Let me know what, <laughs> let me know what the word is. The, when that layer of authenticity was like, this album just has to be heard. And it, yeah. it has to be heard right now. Um, what... Besides music, or besides theater, besides acting, because we've spoken to that, what are you doing now to, and this, well, let this be the final question. Great. What, is, what are you doing now to tell your story? This is a time that we've never had before, so what are you doing now to tell your story in a way that you've never told it before? Very interesting question. I am... Um... Just thought of it. Thank you. Maybe you save save it. Ask somebody else. So ask somebody else. It. I wasted um, this question on Alex Boniel. No, 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 no. <laughs> you're about to get an answer from the heart and the soul. Dig um, it. I have been. I have always been somebody who is comfortable and feels that it is important, as somebody who is a public figure. Look, I'm not like a celebrity, but like there are people who know who I am, right? And I've always thought that it was important to very openly and honestly communicate everything about um, everything about who I am within reason. Um, you know, I've, I've always very freely spoken about like the stuff I've dealt with, with like my own mental, mental health stuff. And I've always made myself available, especially as somebody who like, again, has played numerous characters who take their own life. I, I try to make myself available to the young, um, the young fans who may feel that same way. But I think part of this has made me kind of go a little bit inward Hmm. and shut up a little bit. And I think I'm telling my story right now by not telling it because I'm acknowledging that I don't know everything. And I'm acknowledging that I don't have something valuable, valuable to say all the time. And then that's okay. Hmm. And I'm, I'm learning more about myself as like a dude by just not talking as much. Um, Whether that, whether that has to do with politics, whether it has to do with, um, you know, everything involving race in the country right now, or that has been going on since the dawn to talk about it now. But, but I, 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 I'm just learning. I'm, 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 I feel like I'm telling my story by shutting the fuck up and letting people smarter than me talk. And I'm sitting here and I'm trying my absolute best to listen and I'm not perfect, but I'm trying so that when the time, when it makes more sense for me to talk and people are listening again, for you know eventual hopeful career reasons you know what i mean like i'll have more to say um so i think that's what i'm doing and then um i think i think i'll leave it at that because i think if i go any further i'm going to make it sound less cool (laughs) 